Hey babe, and anybody else watching, and welcome back to A Life Together. Today we are looking at 2 Corinthians 1 through 4. If you remember last time we were finishing up 1 Corinthians and looking at spiritual gifts, we looked at worship, we looked at the resurrection of Christ, of the dead, and of the body, and then we also looked at a collection for God's people, and then just some personal, um, some personal affairs that was kind of being wrapped up in that first letter. So today in chapters 1 through 4, uh, we're going to be talking about how God is the God of comfort. We'll be looking at forgiveness, the new covenant, and then also this idea of jars of clay. We'll talk about that really briefly because it's pretty interesting. So again, uh, 2 Corinthians 1 through 4 today. So chapter 1. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God and Timothy, our brother, to the church of God in Corinth, together with all the saints throughout Acacia, grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of compassion and God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our troubles, so that we can comfort those in any trouble with the comfort that we ourselves have received from God. For just as we are the sufferings of Christ flow over into our lives, so also through Christ our comfort overflows. If we are distressed, it is for your comfort and salvation. If we are comforted, it is for your comfort, which produces in you patient endurance of the same sufferings we suffer. And our hope for you is infirm because, <clears throat> or excuse me, and our hope for you is firm because we know that just as you share in our sufferings, so also you share in our comfort. We do not want you to be uninformed, brothers, about the hardships we suffered in the province of Asia. We are under great pressure, far beyond our ability to endure, so that we despaired even of life. Indeed, in our hearts, we felt the sentence of death. But this happened that we might not rely on ourselves, but on God, who raises the dead. He has delivered us from such a deadly peril, and he will deliver us. On him we have set our hope that he will continue to deliver us, as you help us by your prayers. <clears throat> then many will give thanks to you on behalf of the gracious favor granted, in us, in, granted us in answer to the prayers of many. Now, this is our boast. Our conscience testifies that we have conducted ourselves in the world, and especially in our relations with you, in the holiness and sincerity that are from God. We have done so not according to worldly wisdom, but according to God's grace. For we do not write you anything that you cannot read or understand. And I hope that, as you have understood us in part, you will come to understand fully that you can boast of us, just as we boast of you in the day of the Lord Jesus. Because I was confident of this, I plan to visit you first so that you might benefit twice. I plan to visit you on my way to Macedonia and come back to you from Macedonia, and then have you send me on my way to Judea. When I planned this, did I do it lightly, or do I make my plans in a worldly manner so that in the same breath I say yes, yes, and no, no? But as surely as God is faithful, our message to you is not yes and no, for the Son of, for the Son of God, Jesus Christ, who was preached among you by me and Silas and Timothy, was not yes and no, but in him it has always been yes. For no matter how many promises God has made, they are yes in Christ. And so, through him, the amen is spoken by us to the glory of God. Now it is God who makes both us and you stand firm in Christ. He anoints us, set his seal of ownership on us, and put his spirit in our hearts as a deposit, guaranteeing what is to come. I call God as my witness that it was in order to spare you that I did not return to Corinth, not that we lorded over your faith, but we work with you for your joy, because it is by faith that you stand firm. Chapter 2. So, I made up my mind that I would not make another painful visit to you, for if I grieve you, who is left to make me glad, but you whom I have grieved? I wrote as I did, so that when I came, I should not be distressed by those who ought to make me rejoice. I had confidence in all of you, that you would all share my joy. For I wrote to you out of great distress and anguish of heart and with many tears, not to grieve you, but to let you know the depth of my love for you. If anyone has caused grief, he has not so much grieved me as he has grieved all of you, to some extent, not to put it too severely. The punishment inflicted on him by the majority is sufficient for him. Now instead, you ought to forgive and comfort him, so that he will not be overwhelmed by excessive sorrow. I urge you, therefore, to reaffirm your love for him. The reason I wrote to you was to see if you would stand the test and be obedient in everything. If you forgive anyone, I also forgive him. And what I have forgiven, if there is anything to forgive, 
I have forgiven in the sight of Christ for your sake, in order that Satan may not outwit us, for we are not unaware of his schemes. Now, when I returned to Troas to preach the gospel of Christ and found that the Lord had opened the door for me, I still had no peace of mind, because I did not find my brother Titus there, so I said goodbye to them and went on to Macedonia. But thanks be to God, who always leads us in triumphal procession, procession in Christ, and through us spreads everywhere the fragrance of the knowledge of him. For we are to God, the aroma of Christ among those who are being saved and those who are perishing. To one, to the one we are the smell of death, and to the other the fragrance of life. And who is equal to such a task? Unlike so many, we do not peddle in the word of God for profit. On the contrary, in Christ we speak before God with sincerity, like men sent from God. Chapter 3. Are we beginning to commend ourselves again? Or do we need, like some people, letters of recommendation to you or from you? You yourselves are our letter, written in our hearts, known and read by everybody. You show that you are a letter from Christ, the result of our ministry, written not with ink, but with the Spirit of the living God, not on tablets of stone, but on tablets of human hearts. Such confidence as this is ours through Christ before God. Not that we are competent in ourselves to claim anything for ourselves, but our competence comes from God. He has made us competent as ministers of the new covenant, not of the letter, but of the Spirit. For the letter kills, but the Spirit gives life. Now, if the ministry that brought death, which was engraved in letters on stone, came with glory, so that the Israelites could not look steadily at the face of Moses because of its glory, fading though it was, will not the ministry of the Spirit be even more glorious? If the ministry that condemns men is glorious, how much more glorious is the ministry that brings righteousness? For what was righteous has no glory now in comparison with the surpassing glory. And if what was fading away came with glory, how much greater is the glory of that which lasts? Therefore, since we have such a hope, we are very bold. We are not like Moses, who would put a veil over his face to keep the Israelites from gazing at it while his radiance was fading away. But their minds were made dull, for to this day the same veil remains when the Old Covenant is read. It has not been removed, because only in Christ is it taken away. Even to this day, when Moses is read, a veil covers their hearts. But whenever anyone turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And we, who are with veiled faces, all reflect the Lord's glory. We are being transformed into likeness with ever-increasing glory, which comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. Chapter 4. Therefore, since through God's mercy we have this ministry, we do not lose heart. Rather, we have renounced secret and shameful ways. We do not use deception, nor do we distort the word of God. On the contrary, by setting forth the truth plainly, we commend ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. And even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing. The God of this age has blinded the minds of unbelievers so that they cannot see the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. For we do not preach ourselves, but Jesus Christ as Lord, and ourselves as your servants, for Jesus' sake. For God, for God, who said, let light shine out of darkness, made his light shine in our hearts to give us the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Christ. But we have this treasure in jars of clay, so that all this surpassing power is from God and not from us. We are hard-pressed on every side. We are crushed, but not crushed, perplexed, but not in despair, persecuted, but not abandoned, struck down, but not destroyed. We always carry around in our body the death of Jesus, so that the life of Jesus may also be revealed in our body. For we who are alive are always being given over to death for Jesus' sake, so that his life may be revealed in our mortal body. So then, Death is at work in us, but life is at work in you. It is written, I believed, therefore I have spoken. With that same spirit of faith, we also believe and therefore speak, because we know that the one who raised the Lord Jesus from the dead will also raise us with Jesus and present us with you in his presence. All this is for your benefit, so that the grace that is reaching more and more people may cause thanksgiving to overflow to the glory of God. Therefore, we do not lose heart. Though outwardly we are wasting away, yet inwardly we are being renewed day by day. For our light and mom momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. So, we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but on what is unseen. For what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. That is, 
so powerful. That idea of jars of clay is really interesting. I've heard that phrase so many times, and I think every year when I read through this, I honestly, I just kind of pass over it and point out something else. But I did see this note here in 4.7. 4.7 says, We have this treasure in jars of clay to show us this all-surpassing power is from God and not from us. The note itself says, Where would you keep expensive jewelry? You wouldn't want or you would want a safe, secure place. You wouldn't stash valuables in, say, a tattered cardboard box. Yet this image comes close to the one that Paul used to describe his ministry, quote, jars of clay. In his day, jars were about as common as safe as cardboard boxes of today. The treasure Paul refers, refers to is the incredible Im uh, message of the gospel, go God's good news of forgiveness and the promise of life forever. Yet amazingly, God chose to enclose that treasure in people who are like jars of clay. Clay jars are ordinary and highly breakable, and Paul tells us he is both. An immortal God chooses mere humans as his personal representatives, and who is equal to such a task, Paul asks in 2.16. He determines to draw attention to the treasure inside him, not himself. And that's amazing. I think about how often that, and this is, it's, sad but true but great <laughs> is that the most broken people often have the most amazing testimony the people that have been completely shattered or broken down through this life when they turn to christ you see so much of god in them because they have a testimony saying hey look look at me look what i have made of myself look at the world has made of me and look what i have made of myself i am nothing i am broken i am fallen but look what I have inside of me. And the more broken that that person is, the more we see of Christ. And I think I think when you come to Christ, that happens probably either way. I'm just thinking of this now. I think that maybe that happens either way, that we are broken and come to the end of ourselves and come to Christ. Or maybe we recognize the need for God in our lives and we aren't broken down that much. But when we come to God, we recognize our folly and begin to break even more. Hopefully, right? Hopefully we break even more that we say that is not about me. And even though I didn't go down this spiral of drugs, depression, horrible things, even though I didn't go down that far, I still recognize that I'm a sinner. And the closer I get to God, the more fallen I realize that I am and the more broken, I realize that I am because of my sin, because I know that I don't take sin seriously enough. I don't think anybody does. But the more broken that we become, the more we reveal the Christ in us. Yeah, and that's, that's awesome. Incredibly powerful. Worth praying about. So let's do it. My God, may we always show your glory and not our own. Lord, help us not to paint the clay jars and try and make them more beautiful, Lord, but help the flaws that are shown show you Lord, help us to be okay with pointing out our flaws, but to show that those flaws reveal a love and a mercy and a grace from you that far surpasses any of our brokenness, God, that we may be a minister to others. God, we thank you so much for this analogy. This is a great analogy, Lord. Help us to remember it. When someone comes and says to us, oh, you're believers, oh, you're church people, oh, you're, oh, you're, you must be perfect. Lord, help us to quickly rebuff that and say not at all. Lord, help us to minister by saying, Lord, we are broken, that others may see your glory. My God, we thank you so much for it. And we thank you that we have your son by whom we can show your glory through the Holy Spirit. My God, we thank you so much for Jesus. And it's in his name we pray. Amen. Well, that is about all I have for you today. As always, know that I appreciate you. Wife, appreciate you tons. And I will plan on seeing you tomorrow. Have a good one.